overview of the Avalanche CPU. Now the Avalanche CPU is a small, fast, multi-threaded CPU. It's not a multitasking system in the sense that an RTOS is, and it's not hyper-threading in the Intel sense. It's more like having a multitude of independent CPUs, each running its own program. It's just a single CPU that's running it, but it looks as though it's running more than one CPU. And it does this without any timing jitter whatsoever, so that each CPU thinks it's on its own and it is not affected in any way by instructions being executed by any of the other virtual CPUs. With up to 100 MIPS available at 100 MHz in an ICE 40 HX FPGA, the instructions are accurately divided between all of the virtual CPUs or processors. Every virtual CPU gets an accurate, jitter-free instruction cycle regardless of the activities of the other virtual CPUs. This makes it possible to do precision timing by counting instruction cycles, just as if it were an independent CPU. Avalanche is a pipeline CPU and it never requires a pipeline stall or a pipeline flush. A pipeline stall happens when data is required by an instruction that has been generated by another instruction ahead of it in the pipeline. And if that instruction that's ahead of it has not yet written its data back to main memory, it is not available to the instruction being executed. In that case, you need a pipeline stall, waiting for the data to be written back so that it can be used. This could be one, two, maybe more clock cycles. The problem is even worse with a jump instruction. It's not until right at the end of the instruction pipeline that you know whether you're going to take the jump or not. And if you do take the jump, every following instruction in the pipeline has to be scrapped and you have to wait for a new set of instructions at the new address to come up through the pipeline. That is a pipeline flush. Avalanche never needs a pipeline stall and it never needs a pipeline flush. And we do that by issuing each sequ sequential instruction from a different virtual CPU. In that way, there are never two instructions from the same virtual CPU in the pipeline at the same time. This means that there is never a data dependency within the pipeline requiring a stall, and never a need to flush the pipeline because of a jump instruction. The price to pay for this is that there are a minimum number of virtual CPUs that must be defined. Currently this is seven, the same number as the number of protected pipeline stages. There is no need to protect CPU flags either, because like the RISC-V processor, Avalanche does not have any. There are other ways to do things, you don't actually need flags. Avalanche has got 256 CPU registers and we make all of these CPU registers available so that each virtual CPU can have as many as it needs. Avalanche has a very small footprint on your FPGA. In this case we've shown the Avalanche CPU running a very simple LED blinky program and we've done that because it doesn't require a lot of ancillary logic in the FPGA just a route through to an I.O. pin. And in that way you can see how much space the CPU itself actually takes up. And it's 640 logic cells. If we turn now and look at the memory map of the Avalanche CPU, we see that it has separate program and data spaces. This makes it a Harvard architecture CPU, as opposed to a von Neumann architecture where they are all the same data space. Things like Z80 and 6502 are von Neumann architecture. Processors like the PIC16, PIC18, AVR are Harvard architecture because they have separate data spaces. So the program space is 2K of 32-bit words. Each instruction in the Avalanche CPU is 32 bits wide. There are no exceptions to that. In the data space, the first 256 locations are the CPU registers. They're 16 bits wide, this is a 16-bit CPU. 
all of the CPU registers and the data path, the ALU, is 16 bits wide. There are 256 CPU registers and above those we have 256 I.O. ports defined. That's from 100 hex to 1FF. Above those we have 1K by 8 of data RAM. Now the reason for making the data RAM 8 bits wide and not 16 bits wide as the rest of it is, is because we found that 8 bit wide data is more usable than 16 bit wide data. The Avalanche CPU has no byte access instructions. The locations are 16 bits wide. Even the 8, 1K by 8 of data RAM is a 16 bit wide path, but only the lower byte is actually used and contains any RAM. And the reason for this is we could have 512 by 16 of data RAM, and for the same memory, we could have 1K by 8. And 1K by 8 is more useful. You can hold text strings, maybe, for putting on an LCD display. You can hold the byte-wide data if you're writing to the Pixel LEDs, the WS2812Bs or 2813. So we found it useful to have 8-bit-wide data path for the data RAM. The first three CPU registers, 0, 1 and 2, must be defined in your own assembly code. They should be the first registers that you define so that they are at addresses 0, 1 and 2. And they must contain the values 0, 1 and minus 1 or 0, X, F, 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 which is minus 1. Many of our macro instructions refer to these values and I guarantee you'll also find them very useful to refer to in your own programs. Here you can see the Avalanche instruction set. It comprises of just 18 instructions. Many of these can use the source register 2 or the destination register indirectly. And indirectly means the port address or the memory location pointed to by the register. Those are shown for the add instruction but they also apply to OR AND and exclusive OR. Shift right logical can use the destination register indirectly but not RS1. Clear bit and set bit instructions can clear and set any bit in any CPU register, port address or data memory location. The next set of four instructions use a 16-bit immediate value, either as a value to load into a register or as the target of a jump instruction. The remaining instructions use the destination register as the branch target and this needs to be loaded before you execute these instructions. I'll go into more details on the instruction set together with the macro instructions in another video. Here we have a block diagram of the Avalanche CPU. Now I'm going to be going through this in detail in another video, but for the moment you might like to take note of the numbered columns, which are the pipeline stages for the CPU. We supply the Avalanche CPU as a single Verilog file, ISC licensed. Here you can see the main Avalanche module, and it's essentially this that you will instantiate into your own top-level Verilog. It comprises of an input clock, which can be 70, 80, 100 MHz, whatever you're going to be running the processor at. You have a set of three signals for reading into the CPU. There's the data input bus, the read address, and a read strobe. Likewise, there's a set of three signals for writing out from the CPU to your own peripherals and that is the right strobe, the right address, and the data output bus. And these are the only signals that you need to interface the Avalanche CPU to your own system. You can check out other videos in this series for more specific aspects of the Avalanche CPU, but for now, this concludes our overview.